It's kind of a thing of mine to watch the solar system move. Now, to a degree, you see some of this every day. You know, sunrise, sunset, nothing out of the ordinary until you realize that that's actually the Earth rotating there. That's the Earth spinning that you're looking at. Which means if you're looking at something in the night sky, you're only going to be able to record it for about 12 hours before you get to sunrise. So how far can things in the solar system move in about 12 hours? Well, Jupiter actually rotates once in about 10 hours. So it is actually possible if you get Jupiter at the right time of year when it rises at sunset and sets at sunrise such that it's in the sky for the whole night, you can record an entire rotation of Jupiter in one night of observing, which is what I did about nine years ago. And this is so frequently the case, you almost never hit the mark on the first try. I did this many times, and in some cases, I got some amazing time lapses in that the telescope really isn't tracking Jupiter. In fact, the telescope and the stars are all fixed points of reference in this picture. The only thing that's actually changing is the Earth is merely spinning in the foreground. So after many efforts, I finally managed to get the best one that I ever got, which included a transit of the moon Io. Now that video was one of the hardest that I ever made because I had to sit there freezing my ass off in a clearing in the woods in Wyoming, recording a few seconds of video every couple of minutes and then I had to stitch it all together to make this video of the rotation of Jupiter. And the images that I got there were comparable to the best images of Jupiter from about the year that I was born. But you can also do this with other planets in the sky, say for instance with Uranus. But this is so frequently the case when peering into the void of the unknown. Often the more interesting discovery is not what you went looking for. So that's me there spending the best part of a night trying not to freeze like the snowfields around me for eight hours or so with the telescope tracking Uranus. Condensed into a few seconds, what's impressive is not the motion of the moons, which is quite apparent, especially with the close orbiting Miranda, but the dynamism of the planet moving against the background stars. You see, with the naked eye planets, they tend to be so bright that they wash out the nearby stars. Not so with a very distant and very faint Uranus. And coming much closer to home, the transit of Venus, where Venus moves in front of the Sun over the period of a few hours. Now these things were instrumental in early astronomy in determining just how far it was to the Sun. And because there won't be another one of these for over a hundred years, that's why I put so much effort in going all the way to Hawaii to record this one. And yeah, I traveled halfway around the world to see that. Because you see, the next one of these is in 2117. And even with our advancing medical technology, I don't think I've got a snowball's chance in hell of seeing that. But it does make me wonder what the next civilization that looks up in the sky and sees that little black disc track across the surface of the sun will look like. There you go. That is one day before the total solar eclipse. It's amazing. And exactly one day before the eclipse. Then there are of course things like solar eclipses whose, whose beauty, well, kind of eclipses what you're actually seeing. Gorgeous.
which is the moon actually moving in its orbit across the face of the sun. Again, this is the direct movement of the solar system that you're watching here. Now, by an interesting coincidence, and it is a total coincidence, the sun and the moon both rotate about once per month, which is kind of slow. So slow that it's difficult to actually see anything sensible happen to them over just 12 hours when you can observe them when they're above the horizon. And with the moon, it's especially difficult because the moon also goes around the earth once per month. It's tidally locked, which is why you only ever see one face of the moon when you look at it in the sky. And the only way that you can really tell that the moon is rotating is you can watch the shadows grow on the surface of the moon. Now, I've actually tried to record that several times with only limited success. Yeah, there are technical problems in doing it. Although you can certainly see night falling on the rim of this crater here and the central spike of this crater. But for certain, if you get out with the telescope on just two consecutive nights, you can see a huge change where daytime is on the moon and where nighttime is. So on the first day here, you can see the moon mountains completely in the sunlight, well, albeit at twilight because they've got long shadows. And on the next day, the moon mountains have gone completely into darkness. It's nighttime for them on the moon now. However, I never thought I'd actually be able to see the sun rotate over the period of just a few hours. After all, the sun rotates once a month. That's hella slow. I mean, really, how far can it move in just a few hours? Well, it turns out for the Great American Eclipse of 2017, and I got this really fancy scope that only sees in one wavelength of light, the H alpha. The practical upshot is this telescope is only any good for looking at one object. It can't see anything else. You can only use it to look at the sun. And when I say expensive, this was something over $5,000 just for the telescope. However, it does show some incredible detail on the surface of the sun. And it allows you to see things like solar flares and prominences, which otherwise you would only be able to see during a solar eclipse. Now, when I first looked at the sun through this telescope, it was an incredible experience. I mean, your brain just screens out things like the Earth rotating into sunrise and sunset. It dismisses the sun as this, ah, it's a little bright warm dot in the sky. It's warm, it's friendly. You just don't pay it that much mind until you look at it through a telescope and you see this magma god dynamic and soul-destroyingly powerful and utterly, utterly indifferent to your existence. And there's also this kind of fear that it might become aware of your presence. So the second you come away from the eyepiece and you look out on the brightly lit land, it looks completely different. All of a sudden there's this nameless, baneful eye in the sky that is just bathing everything without even thinking about it with light. And you start to feel more grounded, like you really are an ant in the land of the giants. The sheer scope and effortless power that this thing exudes is just knee-weakeningly intimidating. A point which is emphasized just by the sheer scale of what you're looking at. I mean, remember the transit of Venus? Well, Venus is about the same size as the Earth. But when we were looking at this, Venus was much closer to us than it was to the Sun. So if you were to put the Earth on the face of the Sun and look at it from where the Earth is now, it would be about this size. So if you were to put the Earth on the face of the Sun there, it's the size that it would literally just roll through those black cracks and be swallowed like there was never anything important or significant here at all. You almost feel like you're just going to hide away in the shadows for fear that this thing might notice you. It's no longer a warm, bright dot in the big blue sky. A sunny, warm spot that just provides us with all of the energy for us to grow our food. However, after the powerful emotional response, the scientist kicks in and starts asking the interesting questions. Like, what the hell am I looking at here? What are those black cracks on the baneful eye? Well, it turns out they're exactly the same thing as those prominences that you see on the edge of the sun. It's just when they're on the front of the sun, they appear as black cracks. 
the mass go down the filament here so what, what you're actually looking at here is you're looking at one of these guys but you're looking at it from on top and you see it goes back and forth a huge distance down the filament in the period of about 10 frames that's about half an hour or so you see the sun's made up of convection cells which produce very large magnetic fields and a lot of the sun is so hot that the atoms have split up into electrons and ions and those things move along magnetic field lines in a very similar way to the way iron filings align with magnetic fields so the stage was set for me to actually see how much would change on the sun whilst I was looking at it. So I ordered myself a nice imaging camera and decided to see how much, how much would the sun change in real time. Now in order to do this of course I had to record hours of data. The sun moved halfway across the sky. Uh, sorry, sorry. The earth rotated about a quarter of a revolution. So what happened on the sun during this time? Well the speed at which things can happen on the sun is mind-blowing. It's by far the most dynamic and active thing that you can look at in the solar system. I mean if you're lucky and you see one of these violent eruptions you can literally see it moving in real time. Impressive when you think of just how big this bad boy is. But before I get into the details a quick word on the image processing. So to create a single frame here I take about 200 frames recorded at one per second from the telescope. So that takes about three minutes to record and I combine all of those images to average out the atmospheric shimmer, which allows me to get better resolution, albeit with some minor optical artifacts. So these frames are about three minutes apart. So during that time, a flare much bigger than the Earth can actually erupt, which is mind blowing. When you think, oh yeah, well, what's what's fast here on Earth? You know, the clouds move at maybe 30 miles per hour. Hell, even a tornado is only going to be some 200 odd miles per hour. This thing's going the size of the Earth, 10,000 miles in just three minutes. It's going some 200,000 miles per hour. And the sun is covered with these little plasma hoppers. All right, so what's, what's this one here? Just here, see this? Keep your eye there. Whee! Watch here, and your little hopper. He just hops from one pole to the other. A little mass ejection. Well, this little guy here, who I'll loop a few times. Whee! Just like that. But the activity in some of the big storms is incredible. They're bigger than the Earth and churning with this mighty unseen force of um, magnets. But the thing that really blew me away here when I looked at this over a period of a few hours is you could actually see the sun rotating. Something that I just had never expected to be able to see at all. That is actually the sun rotating. But I never expected to be able to see it actually just rotating before your very eyes like this. But this is what prompted me to make this video because you know how far the sun is going to rotate in a day and you know these prominent systems they can last for days or even weeks. So if you see one there just before it's about to get to the edge of the sun you know that on the next day if it's a nice clear sunny day which it was you know that those prominences will be beautifully projecting off the edge of the sun. And that's what it looks like on the next day. So if you thought that was awesome, actually watching the sun rotate, share it with a friend, because it's good to be grounded with um, our celestial powerhouse and the little corner of the universe that we live in. And if you thought that, yeah, that was a really awesome video and you want to support a guy making videos like this, you can either do it directly through Patreon, and I'll leave the links below, or you can visit my Amazon store where you'll find links to virtually all of the equipment I use to make these videos.